Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. The title of this message is Intentionally Provocative. It is called Never Put Your Guns Down. Never put your guns down. Now, I, um, I did this message in Salt Lake City, Utah, and it was crazy. It was like it just erupted in like a roar. I think half of them actually had like real guns. So just for the record, okay, for everybody watching on live stream and the podcast, I'm not talking about real guns. This isn't some big Second Amendment thing. I'm talking about your spiritual guns, okay? Never put your guns down. So I just got back from... Israel a few weeks ago. Anybody on the Israel trip in this service? Come on. Yep, it was amazing. And um, it's a, every Christian at some point should make a pilgrimage to um, Israel. It's, it's kind of crazy what happens. It's like you, you, you see things that you've, um, you've been reading about, you know, for years and years and you probably read the same story, you know, 20 times. And all of a sudden it's just different when you're standing there. Like I stood in the synagogue in Capernaum where Jesus was kicked out for preaching on the Sabbath. Like, I, I stood there. I was in it. We stood in the Valley of Elah, where David slayed Goliath. I stood on the beach where Jesus restored Peter and said, if you love me, feed my sheep. I put my hands in the Sea of Galilee, the water that Jesus walked on. It's just crazy. I mean, it's just wild actually being there. But nothing was as impacting as going to the city of Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is a crazy place. It's been around for 5,000 years. It's been a city for 5,000 years, one of the oldest cities on planet Earth. 5,000 years. Put in context, our country has been around for like 250 years, okay? This is one city that's been around for 5,000 years. It's been attacked 52 different times. It's been captured and recaptured 44 times. Twice, it's been completely leveled to the ground and rebuilt. This is the city of Jerusalem. It's a crazy place. It was breathtaking, but it was also heartbreaking. And I'll tell you why, and I, and I want to um, explain the reason it was so um, unsettling um, by reading a passage out of uh, the book of Numbers. It's in Numbers 33. If you want to flip there, it's going to be on the screen behind me. But I want to give you a little bit of context before we read this passage. So to catch you up on the history of Israel, uh, God speaks to a man named Abraham and says, hey, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. You are the first. You're the first Hebrew, the first Israelite. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then they, um, you know, they begin to, to, to grow and multiply, but then they're carted off into slavery, and the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt as slaves of Pharaoh. God speaks to a man named Moses and says, you're my guy. You're going to deliver all of these people out of slavery into a land, an actual physical piece of territory that I have set aside for my people. It's flowing with milk and honey. So you're the guy that's going to lead them out. Okay. So God speaks to Moses. He's going to do that. And then, um, uh, they, God gives Moses the playbook on how he is to go into the promised land, okay? So it says, now when you go, there's some rules and there's some the, the ways that I want you to conduct yourself. And so in Numbers 33, that's what we're reading. We're reading how God spoke to Moses and told him to enter into the promised land. Numbers 33, starting in verse 50, it says, now the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. Destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their high, their high places. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess." And you shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among your families. To the larger you shall give a larger inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give a smaller inheritance. There everyone's inheritance shall be whatever falls to him by lot. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. 
So that was the instructions that God gave the children of Israel. When you go in, don't coexist, don't make peace, no treaties, no quarter. You drive them all the way out. And so being in Jerusalem was um, unsettling because it was so abundantly clear that years and years and years and years ago, the Israelites did not heed this command. And the entire city is knifed up and carved up. And this is the Armenian quarter. This is the Jewish quarter. This is the Christian quarter. This is the Muslim quarter. Uh, we can't go over there because that belongs to the Jordanians. And this is the ceasefire line. And we can't. And the whole thing is just carved up and knifed up and, and trying to, you know, keep, keep the tension of treaties and keep peace at bay. And it's so clear that they did not heed this command. And listen, hear me, I'm not saying that the Israelites should go to war with everybody around them. Okay, don't, I'm not saying that, okay? All I'm saying is that years and years and years ago, they did not listen to the command of God. Even the holiest place in all of Israel for the Jewish people, the site of the original temple, they're not even allowed to set foot on today because it is controlled by others. Not even allowed to set foot on the holiest place, the actual location of the temple. And it's crazy because there's a mosque right now on the peak of Mount Moriah, which is where the Holy of Holies originally was, the single most important location on earth for the Jewish people. There's a mosque there right now that Jews are not even allowed to, to go to or be around. And it's crazy because that is the high place of Jerusalem. And what did God say in Numbers? He said, tear down all their high places. And again, I'm not saying just everybody chill out. I'm not saying go invade the mosque or anything like that. I'm just saying that years ago, they did not heed the command of God. And I've actually been, I've been to the site of the temple. It's crazy. And so the temple is not there anymore. If you know your, your history, uh, it was King Solomon that originally built the temple, which I'll talk about here in a second. And then the Babylonians came in, destroyed it all the way to the ground. And then it was Herod that rebuilt the temple. And then the Romans destroyed it again. And I think like AD 70 or something like that. Now all that's left of the temple is this one like stone retaining wall. Okay. And it's giant. I mean, it's a big wall and it's not even a wall of the temple. It's just a wall that retained the earth that supported the temple and it's huge. So you see that wall and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing must've been just crazy. And that is what is called the Western wall, or maybe you've heard it called the wailing wall. And that is to this day, the single most sacred place on earth currently for Jews. It is, it is the last remaining remnants of the original temple. And so maybe you've seen, you know, people go and they visit. And listen, I'm not Jewish, obviously. I'm a Christian. But there's, there's, something, there's something sacred about it. Just when you're there, you just kind of feel like, wow, this is a really special place, you know. And, and so you go and, and they, um, it's quiet and somber and everybody's kind of having a moment. And they, the, it's divided by men and women. So the women go over there. The men go over to this side. And... Um, there's like this six foot kind of, you know, fence that kind of walls off the men from the women. And if you're a guy, you, you have to cover your head. So if you don't have a baseball cap, they give you like a little yarmulke thing. And so, uh, you know, we're going and I, Katie and I are, are um, insane because we brought a seven month old baby to Israel. Um, our baby. Sorry, I said a baby like it was just some random baby. It was my baby. I made the baby. Um, but we brought our seven month old son to Israel. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, we're going to go have a moment, but she's a girl, so she's got to go that way, and I'm over here. And I love it because my son already is rebellious because he went over to the girl's side with his mama. So he's already breaking rules. He's already a disruptor, so I love that. And so, you know, I go over, and, and I just had a moment and just kind of prayed, and it was, it was, it was cool. It was powerful. And you, they, um, people write down little prayers on pieces of paper, and you, like, crumble it up as tight as you can. You, like, shove it into all the crevices of the wailing wall. I mean, it's just, like, white paper is, like, squirting out of – it's crazy. Anyway, so I just, um, over there and had a moment. It was awesome. But then I'm, I'm a good husband. And so I'm just wondering, is my wife okay? Because she has a seven month old baby over there. And I just want to make sure like he's not like pooping in the most holy sacred place in all of the holy land or whatever. So I just decide I'm going to go and take a little peek and make sure she's doing fine. And so I walk over, the wall is only like six feet tall. And so I just get up on my tiptoes and I'm looking over to see if I can find her. And a friend of mine from East Lake campus takes a picture and I look like the single biggest creep in the world. So I have this picture here. So I look like the pervert at the wailing wall who's like trying to like sneak a little peek of, you know, some of the girls. And then we got this rabbi here on his phone. I think he's talking to the Lord probably. Um, 
Anyway, so it's crazy. I have been there. I, this, is, this is the site, like the holiest place to the Jewish people. And, um, and they're not even allowed to set foot on the, the area of the temple there on top of, the, um, of the, the mountain there. And so we had a tour guide. His name was Shraga ben Yosef. And um, his knowledge of ancient Israel and um, even modern day Israeli history and even Christian history was insane. And so you walk around and you wear like this little earpiece and he has a microphone and he just walks and just talks. It's almost like he's talking to himself, but he's just talking in your ear. And it's just like just this constant stream of information. And I remember, you know, we were walking, he was just talking about all the wars and the history of Israel. And, and he just kind of, it was a passing comment. But to me, it just like, it was one of those moments, I don't know if it's happened to you, where something that wasn't meant to be profound, it's like God grabs it and just like, poof, just kind of shoves it into your heart. And uh, we were just walking and he was talking about all the different wars. And he said, oh yes, you know, in Israel, we can never put our guns down. And it was just like, poof. And I knew that there was something there was something to that, that, that there was weight to that outside of just those handful of words that we can never put our guns down. And Israel as a nation is, there's 7 million Jews that live in Israel, and um, they're surrounded by 900 million people that don't believe that they have a right to exist as a country. And there's constantly disputes over territory. You know, it's the Gaza Strip, it's the West Bank, it's the Golan Heights. There was one spot we were standing where they had an entire battle over a treaty that had already been signed. So the treaty was already signed and they had drawn a, a boundary on a map. This is like back in like 1930 or something. They had drawn a, a boundary on a map, said, okay, that's y'all, this is us. And it was in pencil. Well, then the actual width of the pencil line on the map is technically like a half mile in like real earth space. So they had an argument and a battle over the width of the pencil line on a map, okay? So it is just always under dispute, always in battle. And so he says, we can never put our guns down. Now, that's my one point, okay? I don't have three points. This isn't five steps to financial freedom. All right, I have one point. So if you're taking notes, you can write down my one point, which is never put your guns down. That's the point. Point one of one. Now, in order for that to make sense for us, you know, I mean, I, we don't live in Israel. We live here. We're not Jewish. Most of us, maybe some of you are, but I would assume most of us in here are Christians. So what does that mean for us as Christians? Well, in order for it to make sense, we got to go back a ways. We have to go back to the beginning. So everybody buckle your seatbelt for a second. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God makes a garden and puts a man in the garden and tells him to tend and to keep the garden. Okay. Now, by definition, that would mean that the Garden of Eden is a temple, okay? Because the word temple just means dwelling place of God. And the Bible says that God would walk with Adam in the cool of the garden. God dwelt in the garden. So it was the dwelling place of God. So by definition, a temple. Every temple has a pattern. It has an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. And every temple has a high priest whose job is to prevent the defilement of the temple. So the Bible says that there's a land called Eden, outer court. In the land called Eden, there's a garden, holy place. And in the garden, there's a tree that is super special and sacred to God, the holy of holies. There's also a high priest in the garden of Eden whose job was to tend and keep it, who was? Adam, very good. And Adam sucked at his job. Okay, Adam failed miserably. His one job, it's like you have one job, is to prevent the defilement of the temple, didn't do it, and so, as we know, they get evicted from Eden. Now, pay attention, it's interesting. So there was a, a gate in Eden that faced east, and the Bible says that Adam and Eve were escorted out the gate from west to east through the gate, and that God placed a flaming cherubim with a sword to prevent anybody from being able to enter the garden henceforth. So, fast forward into the wilderness with Moses, and God says, okay, Moses, um, I would like for you to build me a tabernacle that I may dwell among my people. Tabernacle is a big fancy church word. You don't have to be scared when you hear it because it just means tent. Anytime you hear the word tabernacle, just think tent. So God says, I want you to build me a tent. And here's the pattern for the tent. It's going to have an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. And there's going to be a high priest named Aaron who's going to take care of it. Interestingly, God says on the doorway to the holy place, I want you to hang a tapestry. And on the tapestry, I want you to weave an image of a flaming cherubim. So now 
the high priest Aaron would go from east to west because the gate of the holy place faced east. He would go from east to west past the flaming cherubim into the dwelling place of God. Literally the exact undoing of what happened in the Garden of Eden. So we see this picture of the very first tabernacle, the very first temple was God speaking to us, showing us that this is me undoing what was done in Eden. This is me restoring my ability to dwell among my people. Okay, so we had the tabernacle tabernacle there. Fast forward a little bit more. Here we are at King David. Now listen, when you go to Israel, you, you learn some things about this guy named David. All right. We think of him as sweet shepherd boy that plays a harp. Okay. This guy was a savage, like borderline monster. Like literally David would go in and kill his enemies. Then he would kill all the women and the children too. He was a mercenary for the Philistines at one point, okay? That's insane. Actually, it's like really bad. It's called treason, okay? It's kind of a big deal. Like he literally went and fought for God's enemies for a season of his life. Like this man was wild. So God says, you know what? I'm sick of living in a tent because I'm God. I deserve more than a tent. So I would like someone to build me a house. He goes to David and he literally says, David, you can't do it because you have too much blood on your hands, Imagine when God looks at you and goes, yeah. that, that, would, that would cut deep. That would probably have hurt David's feelings a little bit. But God's like, seriously, you can't, you can't build it. You have too much blood on your hands. So I'm going to use your son, Solomon, to build the temple. So Solomon builds the very first temple in Jerusalem at the very top of Mount Moriah. The site is still there today. And he builds it with an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies, and then there's a high priest in charge of preventing the defilement of that temple. Today, the location of the holy of holies, where the holy of holy was in the original temple, is the peak of Mount Moriah, which is where Isaac went to, or where Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac, and where currently there sits um, a Muslim mosque with a golden dome. I'm sure you've seen it. It's like, like the, the main piece of the Jewish, um, of the uh, Jerusalem skyline. And so we see this pattern of temples. They all have the same the outer court, holy place, holy of holies. Okay, so what? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to you? Well, I'm glad you asked. See, we live on this side of the Bible, on the New Testament side of things. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Then Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your body is your body. It's your flesh and bones. And your soul is not the eternal part of you. Your soul is your personality. It's your consciousness. It's what makes you, you. And we know that intuitively. If you see a musician play something beautifully, you may say, wow, they played that with so much soul. When what we're saying is they put themselves, the nature of who they are into that piece of music. And your spirit is the eternal part of you, the holy of holies. You see body, outer court, Soul, holy place, holy of holies is your spirit. And there is a high priest over the temple that prevents your defilement. Thankfully, it's not you. Thankfully, it's not me. It's Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews says that he is our great high priest, that the king of kings, the Lord of lords, prevents your defilement, the defilement of the temple of God. He is our high priest. You are the temple. You are the temple. Which means that you, in your own, you are an Israel because you house the temple. And so just how, and listen, everything that happened in the Old Testament and the physical is a picture of what God is going to do in the spiritual in the New Testament. So ancient Israel, even modern day Israel, in the physical has enemies all around them. In the same way, you have enemies all around you, but they're not Physical enemies, I mean, I hope not. I mean, if you live in Forest Ranch and have enemies all around you, then you've, you're not a good neighbor, I guess. I don't know. 
Not physical enemies, but spiritual enemies. You are surrounded by enemies that want to take you down, that want to siphon off little slivers of territory from you. They want to take the Gaza Strip in your finances. They want to take the West Bank in your marriage. They want to take the Golan Heights in your sexual purity. They, whatever. They want to siphon off these little... And listen, if you do not heed this command... If you do not drive them out all the way, if you, make, if you make the decision to coexist, the Bible is clear that they will be irritants in your eyes and a thorn in your side. They will harass you. Have you ever had sand in your eye? It's the worst. Okay, that's what the Bible says. If you do not take care of your territory, if you do not drive out the enemy, if you do not drive out the inhabitants, it's gonna be like living your life with sand in your eye is what the Bible says, to drive them out. Do not coexist in your life. You are responsible for defending the personal territory in your life. You can never put your guns down. And listen, if you, and if Israel has seen this 10 million times. Like the, there was one point where they controlled the Sinai Peninsula and then decided, hey, you know what? Let's, in, in the, the name of peace, we're gonna surrender that. And, you know, and it's like all that happens, the minute you surrender a piece of territory in the name of peace, all that happens is the enemy just goes, all right, cool, now I'd like that. It's all that happens. Okay, so if you try to, in your own life, in your own personal life, with your own demons and strongholds that are trying to take territory from you, if you just say, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna make peace. I'm just gonna try to just coexist. I just can't handle the warfare. It, there is no peace. The minute you cede a little bit of territory, it's just, and the enemy is just that much closer to you. You can never put your guns down. So as we come into this vision builders season, um, and again, Sir Charles, um, said it so beautifully that vision builders is how we as a church gain ground, take territory, secure the future. The, the tithe is the, the, the returning of the first 10% of your income into the house of God, and that covers the day-to-day -day operations of the church. But vision builders is how we buy buildings, procure land, secure the future. And there is no way that we would have been able to do what we did in 2020 had we not owned the majority of our buildings. What do you call it when you rent from somebody? Who are they? Landlord. Your landlord. They have all the power. They are your Lord in the sense of, and listen, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not gonna bow to uh, any Lord except for Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords. And so when we, uh, because we owned our own buildings, we were able to meet and have church and be a light for a community that was desperately hurting in 2020. So I wanna give you just like a personal example from my own life of what this looks like and just how insidious the devil can be, okay? So when I look at um, the life of Mike and Katie Yeager in the, in the past 10 years, one of the greatest miracles, probably top three greatest miracles in our life is the relationship we have with money. When I first came to this church, I, you know, I just didn't come from a super well-to-do family. It was always like the minute money came in, money went out, always paycheck to paycheck, always hand to mouth. And I just, I was convinced that I would never amount to anything. I was never gonna be able to provide for a wife, never gonna be able to provide, let alone for children, was always gonna live paycheck to paycheck. And I just lived under the weight of that, that, that curse and just was certain that I was never. And so now, fast forward 10 years, our church is amazing. That mentality has been broken off of me. And, you know, I wouldn't say I'm independently wealthy and everybody's, you know, we're always believing God for more, but it, there's no doubt. I can look at the, where we are today and where we were 10 years ago and God has blessed us immensely and tremendously. Okay. So it's easy for me to see that. And so let me show you just how crafty this is. It wasn't like the devil came in and all of a sudden, you know, like had a hospital bill that was $10 billion on filing for bank. It wasn't some like crazy overthrow. It was the tiniest little concession where I found myself saying, you know, because my wife and I, the past few months has been a little tough in, in business. I have an engineering company, had a couple of deals that we thought were going to go through that just didn't. And we were like, sure it was going to happen. So I was like, oh my gosh, man, you know, that's, so we were kind of wrestling through that. And so we made this little subtle concession in our mind, which was, you know what? Gosh, when I look back 10 years ago, I mean, where we are today is amazing. And I mean, really, if that's as good as it ever gets, like, gosh, how blessed would we be? Like, that would be, that would be amazing. And it sounds innocent, it sounds, but it's a concession that God cannot do the impossible. And I, made, and I began to coexist 
with a ceiling over what God could do in my finances. And again, it's not crazy, it's not insane, but it's just the tiniest little, and my wife and I were in Israel, we were on the airplane back, we were talking it through, and we just, we realized, like, we had chosen to coexist with the notion that God was limited. And we just said, you know what, phooey to that, nope, not us, not the Jaeger household. So while we were in the air, we made a decision that the minute the wheels touched down in San Diego, er, that we were going to expect the blessing of God on our finances. And so no kidding, like literally the wheels touched down and we looked at each other and the first thing we said was like, all right, can't wait to see what happens. And it's been a really awesome couple of weeks. I landed the second biggest contract in the history of my engineering company just this last week. Because we made the decision not to coexist. And it's the tiniest little thing. So I want to just encourage you as we come around um, vision builders this, this season. And we, you know, are wrapping up our, our pledges from last year, uh, Surge, and diving into a new faith commitment in, um, in this next season of Dominion. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6 that he... he outlines this armor, this proverbial armor. And one of the pieces is the shield of faith. Faith is a weapon of warfare that protects you. And every year, Katie and I make a faith commitment to vision builders. That's a stretch, a big stretch. And when, you know, listen, be wise. Don't say, oh my, we're going to give a hundred million dollars. And like you, you're literally, your AGI was like $30,000 last year. Okay. Um, you know, good for you for, for being a person of faith, but, you know, that's, be wise. It's about stretching and a, creating a gap for God to fill. I heard Pastor Jurgen say one time that God lives on the other side of questions that we don't have the answer to. And so for Katie and I, we make a commitment to vision builders that, you know, we're going we're gonna to do our part. We're going to work. And listen, every year, vision builders pushes me to hustle, to claw, to scratch, to have some late nights, work some weekends to, to make it happen. But we also, we create a gap for God to show up. And, and listen, it, it, this is, there is biblical precedence all through this. God said to Moses when he stood on the bank of the, of the Red Sea, stretch out your hand and I'll part the sea. He didn't say, hey, check this out. You're about to witness something awesome. He said, no, you do something first, then I'll move. He said to Moses, stretch your hand out over the water. And as Moses, in faith, reached his hand out, the waters began to part. So I want to just encourage you in this vision builder season, use faith as your shield. It will, as you step out in faith, God will protect you. Your faith will defend your own personal territory because it is a weapon of warfare. And lastly, as we close, and listen, this, this, isn't, this could be in every, any and every area of your life. It's not just financial. It could be in your, your marriage. Maybe you feel like in your marriage, you've, you've got a, a good marriage, maybe even a great marriage. But maybe there's just one little conversation that's off limits, and you, you and your, your spouse have just seen some subtle walls coming up. That's, that's the Gaza Strip in your marriage. Do not coexist. Do not drive the inhabitants of the land out. Maybe it's in your parenting. Maybe you're a great dad, a great mom, but there's one area of, you know, one conversation that's off limits. Or, you know, I don't know. That's the West Bank and your relationship with your kids. Do not coexist. Do not make peace. Drive them out. Because if you don't, it will be as if you have an irritant in your eye and a thorn in your side, and it will harass you all the days of your life. When I first came to this church, kind of a weird thing to say in front of my in-laws, but here we go. I was um, addicted to pornography, had brought all kinds of um, sexual baggage into my marriage that was made marriage really hard for the first couple of years. And thankfully, our church is amazing and was able to break the stronghold of pornography over my life and and get incredible victory in that area. Now, it's easy to say, that's a pretty big win, you know? All right, good job. I'm awesome. Way to go. So then it's like not, not quite as big of a deal if there's, you know, a covert thought here or there or taking a peek at somebody a little longer than I should. And it's just kind of like, well, I mean, I conquered the big giant. So these other little things, just not that big of a deal. It is coexisting. You have to drive the inhabitants all the way out, all the way out. And so, and listen, I wish, I wish that there's times, and if this has happened to you, then, you know, good for you. And I'm saying that 
half mad at you because it's frustrating. That we're, there are moments, and I've seen God do it for people, and I've seen God do it in my life in other areas, where he'll deliver in an instant. We're literally like, you will have struggled with something your whole life, and then boom, somebody prays for you, and then it just goes away. And praise God, that's amazing. It doesn't happen all the time like that. And I'm gonna tell you why. There's a very, very powerful reason. It's because how you get a thing is how you keep a thing. So if you get something for free, you'll think that you can keep it for free. The reason God makes you wrestle with that struggle, and you may, maybe you've gone to five Emerge conferences and it's just like, why can't I kick this, this thing, whatever it is? It's because God is building in you somebody who can fight for something. Because if you don't know how to fight to get it, you're not gonna know how to fight to keep it. Maybe you've gone to Cherish Conference or a Cherish Night and you're back at the altar again and you're just beating yourself up. Why am I having somebody pray for the same thing again and again? The way of the righteous, the Bible says, winds upwards. You know what a winding spiral looks like when you look down on it? A circle. You look down, it looks like you're just going in circles but you're going around and up, around. So when you come back to the same thing and you're like, golly, really this again? I'm struggling with this again? Yes, you're struggling with that again, but now on a new level, now a little bit higher. God is building in his people somebody who can fight for something because if you don't know how to fight to get it, when the devil comes along to take it from you, you're gonna think that you get to just keep it for free and it'll be snatched out of your hands. So God is building in you someone who can fight for things so that you can keep those things things. Why don't we hop to our feet really, really quick and one just as we close out here, take a second and um, as I was prepping this and, and knowing I was going to deliver this here at Balboa, I was asking and praying that the Holy Spirit, as I preached, would illuminate in some of you an area of your life where you have coexisted. And again, maybe that's in your finances. Maybe it's in your own mental health and the way you talk about yourself. God says that you are made in the image of him, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so when you look in the mirror and you say, I'm disgusting, I'm pathetic, I, God's like, really? Wow, because I say that you're my masterpiece, so that's pretty rude. Maybe it's, maybe it's in your own mental health. Maybe it's in your friendships. Maybe it's in your parenting. I don't know, and it doesn't matter. But I've been praying that God would illuminate in you an area or multiple areas where you're like, shoot, you know what? I am, I am coexisting. I, ha I have ceded territory to the enemy. And I wanna give you an opportunity here as we bow our heads and close our eyes to, to make a commitment to take it back that you're gonna make a commitment to take it back. So if that's you and, and know that there's an area of your life, I'm not gonna ask you what it is. You're not gonna have to come on stage or anything crazy. I want you to just there in your seat. If that's you, I wanna take a second. I wanna pray for you. I want you to lift your hand if you know. If you're, gonna, you're making a commitment right now that yes, there is an area in my life that I have surrendered, whether it's a bunch of territory, a little bit of territory, an inch, a mile, whatever, but you know that you're ready to take it back now today. You're gonna make a commitment here today. I'm gonna pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, you see every single hand lifted. And God, we as, as, as a, a church people declare right now, right now, that we are not powerless, that we are not victims to the circumstances around us. We are not victims to the enemies that encircle us. God, that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Not because we're so disciplined and we're so type A and we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and grit our way to it, but because you have imparted to us the Holy Spirit, which gives us power. So we declare right now, victory coming into the lives of the men and women with their hands lifted. We declare strongholds broken in Jesus' name, generational curses falling off of people's lives. I just see men and women going to men's prayer this next Tuesday, women's prayer this next Thursday, going up to a leader and saying, hey, I, this is it. I'm drawing a line in the sand. And I see you just going to battle in prayer with your, um, with your friends. And they're gonna, they're gonna come alongside of you. They're gonna be a shield that you can, can hide under in, in this season. And I just see husbands and wives coming to one another and sitting around even the lunch table today after church and saying, hey, babe, we've got a great marriage, but there's just one area where I just feel like we've, we've conceded where I feel like we're co coexisting with
with the enemy, let's draw a line in the sand and say, no more. I see fathers getting down on their knees with their son or their daughter and saying, listen, I know daddy hasn't gotten it 100% right, but I am determined to be a better father moving forward. I see you in business. I see you take, making a declaration that I'm not going to settle for a God that's limited. I'm not gonna say of myself that I can't do it. I see you breaking those strongholds of poverty, stepping in to new levels of financial freedom. And listen, it's not so that you can live a comfortable life. The Bible says that God has given us the power to get well not so that we can drive nine Maseratis and have a life that's all focused on us, so that we may establish his covenant in the earth. You, as an heir to the promise of Abraham, are blessed to be a blessing, that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So right now, Heavenly Father, we release, we release angel armies that are gonna go to battle on our behalf. We declare victory. We expect victory. This week, we will see chains breaking off of our lives in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe that, say amen. Man, come on. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.